Violence hit the streets of Dublin last week as a shocking stabbing attack outside a school resulted in what has been described by the police as the most violent riots in modern Irish history. There's been a lot, a lot of debate about the causes of these shocking events, with far-right groups uh, and even uh, former mixed martial arts star Conor McGregor blamed for some of the violence. So, uh, following the Tottenham riots of 2011, Irish journalist David Quinn wrote, wrote what turned out to be a prescient article where he outlined why similar scenes could be witnessed in Ireland. And David Quinn joins me now. David, thanks very much for joining me. Can you give us some sense of the context? Because when it comes to these Dublin riots, a lot of people were very, very quick to dismiss it as just simply a case of the far right in Dublin mobilising and taking this opportunity. Uh, do you think that's uh, accurate or is it more complicated? Um, I think there's something to it all right. I mean, there seems little doubt that there was some chatter on various social media platforms from genuine far right elements who were trying to stir up trouble as a result of the, of the terrible stabbing of three children and a teacher who went to defend them outside that school last Thursday week. But I think there was also kind of a tinderbox thing going on in the city centre, just like in Tottenham in 2011, which your viewers might remember, sparked five nights of riots. I was reading about it again there the other day for my column today. This spread to 66 areas in Britain over um, those five nights. There was five people killed. There was hundreds of police officers injured. And at the time, you had people like David Lammy, currently on the Labour Shadow Cabinet and an MP for, for Tottenham. And he was saying, well, actually, in these areas where these riots broke out, you've got a big breakdown in basic respect for law and order. You have many of these um, uh, teenagers and young men growing up without positive male role models in their lives. Uh, there's a bit of a powder keg situation going on, that there are a lot of uh, tensions within the community, people who feel that their voices aren't being heard, that their concerns are being ignored by the media class and the political class. Do you think that's partly to, uh, to blame for what happened here? Well, there's undoubtedly rising tensions around the issue of immigration because, um, like, Britain is worried that it's straining at the seams because of the number of people who've been brought in in the last number of years. So I was looking at the figures. So the British population has grown by 6% over the last 10 years. The Irish population has grown by 10% over the last 10 years. So this is one of the, I think it's about the second fastest rate of population growth in the European Union. The average country in the European Union is growing, has grown only by 1% of the last 10 years, we've grown by 10%. This is an enormous rate of population increase. 20% of the Irish population was born outside the country. That compares to 15% in the US. So this is an unprecedented level of change in a small country in a short amount of time. We have a housing shortage here. Uh, the, strains, the strains on the infrastructure, just like in Britain, there's particular areas that are absorbing most of the immigrants. Um, so it's easy for somebody like me in a middle class area to lecture people in disadvantaged areas um, about their attitude towards immigration. But I don't live with multiculturalism. I don't live with multi-ethnicity. I don't live with, um, with high levels of immigration where I live. But the people in these other disadvantaged areas, they typically do. And essentially, they're not allowed to have an opinion about it because if they express any concern at all, they're accused of hate and they're accused of racism. And that frustrates and people. And of course, that kind of approach where, where the p political class just sort of says, if you raise concerns about what's going on in your community, you're just an evil bigot. You know, that's going to generate mm -hmm. even more resentment, isn't it? And you're, you're generating a kind of powder keg situation that's, that's bound to. Now, of course, I'm not justifying violence or looting or mob, mob violence, anything like that whatsoever. But the point is that those in the centre, those who are meant to be sensible p political figures, just are, are not taking these concerns seriously. When uh, Ashley Murphy was murdered, and this was uh, th this happened very recently, absolutely tragic case, and her boyfriend Ryan Casey wrote an impact statement uh, that alluded to the, the fact that this was a, a, a migrant who committed this act. The Irish media re redacted his witness statement. They they they, they censored it. Uh, they they seem to think that it's their role to sort of um, uh, pr protect the public from knowing what people have said and knowing the truth. Do you think that's a, 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 a broader problem within the Irish media? Well, I do. Um, I mean, so Ashley Murphy's boyfriend, as you say, Ryan Casey, he gave a very long and impassioned victim statement and it was very selectively quoted from by most of the media. Some of it did quote the thing in full, but he said the Ireland that um, Ashling and himself grew up in had changed, it had become more dangerous. I don't think he made any direct reference to immigration at all, but he did mention the fact that Ashley Murphy, his girlfriend's killer, um, had been in the country for a number of years purely on welfare and he questioned 
by that was so. And then we had a particular journalist who works for the Irish Times accusing him of hate speech. So you've got to consider that his girlfriend was brutally murdered and he makes a victim impact statement and then he's accused of hate speech. And of course, as I've been on this program before discussing, we have hate speech legislation coming up, very draconian, very far reaching, that they now want to have passed before Christmas on the strength of the Dublin riot. And are we now to believe that Ashley Murphy's boyfriend, Ryan Casey, would be prosecuted under that act if it was enforced now when he made that statement. I mean, it's a horrifying prospect. So that's a really interesting point, isn't it? Varadkar has, has already, I think, used these Dublin riots to justify the hate speech bill that he wants to push through. There is, There does seem to be a groundswell of opposition there. But if it's the case that what he's going to do is just use these kind of events to, to say that what we'll do is we'll just silence all opposition, this strikes me as very authoritarian. Is that a fair characterization? No, extremely. I mean, the Irish political establishment really does have to stop itself and check uh, what it's doing. Because in trying to delegitimize perfectly legitimate concerns about can we cope with the numbers coming in? I mean, Ireland, for example, um, has taken in per capita a bigger number of Ukrainian refugees than any country in Western Europe. Um, and you've got to ask, well, OK, can we cope with this? France has taken in far fewer than we have, even in absolute terms, even though it has about 12 times our population. So these are the questions that ordinary people ask. Um, an opinion poll recently for one of our newspapers said 75% of Irish people think the numbers coming in are now too high, and they don't have a single uh, mainstream party representing that 75%. And that's not right. So where do those 75% go when their concerns are simply dismissed as, as bigoted outlandish, extreme and racist. So, I mean, it has to have an effect somewhere. And, and those views don't even appear to be partisan. It's not as simple as left versus right. I mean, I believe that the, the figures for, for Sinn Féin supporters or voters are even higher than 75% who think that, that there's been too much migration. So it's not as though we can just put this down to a left-right discussion, is it? No, and you see, Sinn Féin draws a lot of its support from working class areas, and they're the ones, obviously, who, you know, which are most greatly impacted by this. But sooner or later, the dam has to break in Ireland, uh, politically speaking. So in the Netherlands, um, I'm not even speaking about Gerd Wilders here. I'm speaking about what the, the party that was called Christian Democrats, I'm not sure what their name is now, which is headed by this um, Turkish former refugee who came in with her parents. I think her father was a Kurdish trade unionist who was driven out of Turkey, and um, she was a child when they fled to the Netherlands. So here you have the irony. The head of the second party, which was in power until very recently, in the Netherlands, a former refugee from Turkey, and she's saying we have to limit the numbers coming in to the Netherlands in order to stabilise the country and allow it to kind of absorb what it's taken in in the last few years. We, as a country, proportionately have taken in more. So the equivalent of this um, of this particular party, the former Christian Democrats in Ireland, is Fine Gael, which is headed by Leah Varadkar. So this politician, his equivalent in Netherlands, would be condemned as far right here in Ireland. But here we have his political counterpart in the Netherlands saying things that are practically unsayable here. And the more unsayable they make them, sooner or later, they're going to get the outcome they don't want which is that an Irish Gerd Wilders would emerge. And I don't want that to happen. I wish mainstream politicians would begin to honestly address honest and legitimate concerns of ordinary people. David Quinn, always a pleasure to chat. Thanks for joining me on the show.